All right, I hope you all are doing well today. Um, we're going to be talking about mesh analysis, which is a very similar tool uh, to nodal analysis that we talked about on Wednesday. But instead of using Kirchhoff's current law to set up our system of equations for analyzing the circuit, instead we are going to use uh, Kirchhoff's voltage law. We are going to start uh, by looking at circuits that only contain voltage sources uh, because current sources tend to break things a little bit. Uh, so once we kind of get our head wrapped around how the basics of mesh analysis works, uh, then we'll introduce current sources and talk about what to do in the event that we have one of those present. So um, we are going to do this very similarly to how we did with nodal analysis. We are going to start with a circuit, and then we're going to go through the steps that are required. Um, so the circuit that we're going to start with today um, is this one. So let's say that we have a 10-volt source here. a 9 ohm resistor here, a 2 ohm resistor here, a 4 ohm resistor down here, let's put a 6 ohm resistor here, an 8 ohm resistor here, and then let's throw a dependent voltage source here in the middle. I'm going to put the positive polarity on the right, and let's make this a 2 Ix, so a current controlled voltage source, and our current Ix will be the current that's flowing down through the 4 ohm resistor like so. All right, so our first step when we are applying the mesh analysis technique will be to simply identify our meshes. Can anybody remind me of what a mesh is? We learned about this on the first day of class, I believe. Meshes can only contain one loop, right? Exactly right. So a mesh is the smallest possible loop that doesn't contain any other loops. So hopefully we can all see very easily that there are three meshes in this circuit. Um, so I'm going to identify them and I'm going to do it um, a way that I don't normally do here first while we're getting uh, used to things. So This will be our first mesh. Um, how I would normally represent this would be this smaller indication of just this one loop, but I want to be very clear about the path that we're going to take when we write our KVL equations at first. Um, so I'm going to leave this big one up for now. Uh, we're going to have a second mesh around this path, and we will have a third mesh around this path. And the arrows that I have drawn are going to indicate 
um, the direction that we're going to take when we write our Kirchhoff's Volta's Law equations here in a little bit. Uh, so one thing that I do want to note is that there's nothing requiring us to write our meshes or identify our meshes as clockwise loops. Um, so we could do clockwise, we can do counterclockwise, we can do a combination of clockwise and counterclockwise. It doesn't particularly matter at all, as long as we're following the rules. Um, but I am of the habit of always writing my loops as a clockwise loop. So that's what I've done here. All right, so our next step is going to be to assign mesh currents. So all I'm going to do is just assign a current to each of these meshes. So let's call this mesh current I, uh, let's call it IA. This mesh current will be IB. And this mesh current will be IC. So let's talk a little bit about what a mesh current means. So we are following our mesh currents around these clockwise paths. So our mesh current IA is really nothing more than a different way of expressing the current that's flowing through the 9 ohm resistor. Uh, similarly, our mesh current IB could be thought of as the current flowing through the 6 ohm resistor and our current uh, mesh current IC could be thought of as the current flowing through the 8 ohm resistor. So um, we're going to do this in just a moment anyway. So let me go ahead and jump to um, talking about what happens when we have multiple mesh currents flowing through a particular element. Okay. So our third step is going to be to express our controlling variables in terms of our mesh currents. So our controlling variable in this system is the current IX which is defined as flowing down through the four ohm resistor. So we are gonna to try to figure out how to express IX in terms of our mesh currents. And what we're going to do is simply figure out which mesh current is flowing in the same direction as it passes through the four ohm resistor and which current is flowing in the opposite direction of IX as it's passing through the four ohm resistor. The current that's in the same direction will get a positive sign. The mesh current that's in the opposite direction will get a negative sign. Uh, so can any of you guys tell me which of our mesh currents is flowing in the same direction as IX as it passes through the 4 ohm resistor? IA. Exactly right. So as IA goes around its clockwise path, when it hits the 4 ohm resistor, it's going to be flowing down through the 4 ohm resistor, which is in the exact same direction as IX. So IA is going to get a positive sign. Um, who can tell me which of our mesh currents is flowing in the opposite direction of IX as it passes through the 4 ohm resistor? I see. I see. Absolutely right. Great job, you guys. So just for anyone who's unclear about this, um, let me spell it out a little bit, right? So IA starts down here and it flows up like so. It's gonna turn and flow this way. It's gonna turn and flow this way. And so IA is flowing down through the four ohm resistor in the same direction as IX. If we were to do something similar 
um, to the green mesh current IC, we would see that it winds up flowing in the opposite direction. So very similar to how we defined a voltage using nodal voltages, uh, we define a current as whichever one is in the same direction minus whichever one is in the opposite direction. All right, so now we're going to move on to our next step. And that is simply to write a KVL equation for each mesh current. Or let me put it in a different way, around each mesh. So we have three different meshes in this circuit. So effectively, we're going to follow those three mesh currents around and just kind of see what voltage drops occur. So let's start with KVL at mesh A. And we're going to start at the bottom left-hand corner, which would be here. And we're going to follow our mesh current IA around its clockwise path. So what's the first thing that we see? Uh, minus 10 volts. Exactly right. So we see the negative polarity terminal of the 10 volt source. So we're going to write that as minus 10 volts. What's the next thing we see? Uh, nine amps times, or not nine amps, nine ohms times I. Exactly right. So we see the nine ohm resistor, and because we're following IA around, um, we are effectively going to assume that the current IA is flowing into the positive polarity terminal of any resistors that we see. So we're going to have plus nine ohms times the current IA. What do we see next? Uh, two ohms times IA. So you're partially correct. So we definitely see the two ohm resistor and IA is going to be flowing through that two ohm resistor. But because that two ohm resistor is on the interior of the circuit, there are actually two different mesh currents flowing through it, right? So we can see that the two ohm resistor is shared uh, by mesh A and it's also shared by mesh B because it lies between them. Um, so we are going to have some sort of contribution from the mesh current IB as well. Since our mesh current IB is flowing in the opposite direction as the mesh current IA is when we're looking at the two ohm resistor, we're going to have a total current of IA minus IB flowing down through the two ohm resistor. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. It's good. All right. So what do we see next? The four ohms times IA minus IC. Exactly right. So four ohms times IA minus IC. And now we're back at the same node that we started from. So our Kirchhoff's voltage law equation is finished. So we just set everything equal to zero. So let's look at KVL at mesh B now. So who wants to tell me what this equation is going to look like? Two times IB minus IA. Exactly correct. So two ohms times IB minus IA. Thank you, Leah, I believe. Uh, what, what do we see next? Uh, plus six ohms times IB. Six ohms times IB, absolutely. So we just have an IB there because our element is on the perimeter of the circuit. So there's no other mesh currents opposing it. Uh, what comes next? Do we just put two IX? 
for that, I'm assuming. Exactly right. So we see a voltage source. Um, we see the positive polarity terminal first. So we're just going to add whatever that voltage source is giving us. So plus 2ix, absolutely correct. And we're back to the node that we started from. So we set everything equal to zero. And we move along to our next mesh. So somebody tell me what's going on with mesh C. Do uh four ohms times I C minus I A and do we need a include that minus ix in there or not uh no not at all so you're okay. you're 100 correct by just saying four ohms times ic minus ia if we included the current ix we would actually be counting the currents twice effectively um, so whenever we are writing our kirchhoff's voltage law equation we are for the most part only worried about what the mesh currents are doing so four ohms times IC minus IA, absolutely correct. Uh, what's our next term going to be? Minus two IX. Exactly right. And what is our final term for this mesh going to be? Plus eight ohms times IC. Exactly correct. Set this equal to zero. Um, if we look here, we have one, two, three, four equations for four unknown quantities. Um, so we could simply solve this system either by using a Casio 991 calculator, uh, substituting in our relationship for IX into equations three and four so that we have everything in terms of IA, IB, and IC. We have a three equation, three unknown system. We could throw it into MathCAD. However, we choose to solve our systems of equations. We are ready to do that now. Um, do we actually need to solve the system or can we move along to what happens when we have current sources? Let me see what's going on in chat. Move along. We can just move on. Okay, sounds great to me as well. At this point, we've got everything set up and this is where you guys would get practice using your calculators. Okay, so mesh analysis. Do you have what the answers would be for the currents? Uh, I do not because it's slightly different than the example problem I normally work. I wanted to add a um, dependent source in there just to force us to deal with that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So mesh analysis, current and voltage sources. All right. So I'm going to draw a new circuit for us to analyze using the mesh analysis technique. Um, so let's say that I have a short circuit here. A 10 ohm resistor here. Across this path, I'm going to have a 3 ohm resistor. Here, I'm going to have a five amp source in series with a two ohm resistor. Over here, I'm gonna put a four ohm resistor. Let's put a four volt source here. A dependent voltage source here. 
that depends on, uh, let's see, twice some current IX. We'll put a five ohm resistor here and our current IX will be the current flowing up through this five ohm resistor. And then lastly, we are going to have a six amp source over here on the right. So whenever we have current sources and we're attempting to use mesh analysis, um, we are going to run into an issue whenever we try to write a KVL loop that involves a current source because um, the current source supplies a fixed amount of voltage and excuse me, the current source supplies a fixed amount of current and the voltage drop across it is just whatever it needs to be in order for Telogen's theorem to be satisfied for the system. So effectively, it's gonna be very similar to the issue that we had where we had um, a voltage source connected between two nodes that weren't our reference node. We're gonna wind up introducing what's called a super mesh to take care of it. Uh, I'm going to do that directly here because it is so similar to what we did with the uh, super nodes on Wednesday. But if you guys want me to explain the theory behind it, I'm happy to do so. All right, so let's go through our steps for when we have um, both, or, or when we have current sources and possibly also voltage sources. Uh, so our first step will still be to uh, identify our meshes. So we are going to have this red mesh and I'm going to go ahead and do part of step two and I'm going to just going to label this as our mesh current IA. Um, we are going to have a blue mesh here. And I'm going to go ahead and label this one as a mesh current IB. Let's put a green mesh here. And have a mesh current I see. And lastly, let's put a purple mesh here. And I'm going to have a mesh current ID like so. So we've actually gone ahead and done our second step, which is to assign mesh currents as well. Our third step will be the same as before. We are simply going to express our controlling variable in terms of our mesh current. Would anyone care to tell me what that relationship is going to look like? Two IX equals IB minus IC. So um, you're close, but the controlling variable is this current IX defined as flowing through the five ohm resistor. The two IX that you referenced is the for the associated with the voltage source that's being controlled by this current. So this is the one that we need to be writing the IX equation for. Does that make sense? Yes, so IX is ID minus IC. ID minus IC, absolutely correct. Okay, that's our only controlling variable. So that's the only equation that we're gonna have. So we're not gonna skip 
the steps like we did with um, analysis using supernodes, I'm gonna go ahead and give them to you. Um, so whenever we have current sources, we are going to need to write a current relationship equation. for each current source in our circuit. So I believe we have two current sources. We have a five amp current source on the interior and a six amp current source on the exterior. And so we will need to relate those fixed currents provided by our sources to what our mesh currents are. So let's start with the five amp source. How does the current supplied by the five amp source relate to our mesh currents? So since this is new, I'll give you guys uh, a hint. The process that we're doing here is the exact same thing that we did to define that current Ix in terms of our mesh currents. We're just looking for whichever mesh current is in the same direction, which will give us a positive sign, and then whichever mesh current is in the opposite direction will give us a minus sign. So which of our four mesh currents is in the same direction as the five amp source? I see. I see, absolutely right. And which one is in the opposite direction? I mm -hmm. Absolutely right. So we're gonna do something similar here for our six amp source, but because it's on the outside edge or the perimeter of the circuit, it's only going to have a contribution from one mesh current, right? So because the five amp source was shared between two meshes, we had two mesh currents contributing um, the six amp source is only on the edge of mesh D, so we should only have one current contributing. So what's that relationship going to look like? Just equals ID. Exactly right. If um, our six amp source were direction up instead of direction down, what do you think would happen? The ID would be negative. Exactly right. Great job. All right, so what we're going to do now is we are going to identify a super mesh, okay? So anytime that we have a current source that is shared between two meshes, we are going to have a super mesh. And a super mesh is just the smallest possible loop that combines the two meshes that are touching the current source. So in this case, our super mesh, let's do it in this light blue color, um, is going to just combine meshes A and C. So we might write that like this. So it's going to go around in this way. Once it gets to this branch, it's going to go down through here. Come back up like so. And then keep on along this way. So what this super mesh is doing is it's providing us a closed path for us to write a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation around that effectively just skips over that current source because we can't express the voltage drop across a current source in terms of our mesh currents. So this is just giving us some other relationship to use um, since we can't figure out what the voltage drop across the five amp source is based on our current knowledge of the circuit, okay? So anytime we have a current source on the interior, of a circuit like we have here, we will have a super mesh. Whenever we have a current source on the exterior or perimeter of the circuit, like the six amp source, we don't have a super mesh. 
So step five will be to write a KVL equation. for any super meshes. So we're just gonna follow that light blue line around its clockwise path and then add up all the voltage drops and set them equal to zero. So let's say that we're gonna do KVL at super mesh AC. So would anybody care to help me out with this equation? Do a 10 ohms times IA. Okay. Plus four ohms times IA minus ID. And uh, plus five ohms times IA minus ID. Mm, so when we get down to the branch where we have the five ohm resistor, we're no longer following IA around, we're following IC around. Right, so if we're down here in this section, this is where we're following IC. So it's... Should five ohms times IC minus ID. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. And right. What comes next? Uh, minus two IX. Absolutely correct. And then what should our last term be? Three ohm times IA minus IB. Exactly right. Great job, Baylor, thank you. Uh, before we move on to our next step, um, does anybody have any questions about where any part of that equation came from? All right, so our last step is simply going to be to write a KVL equation for any remaining meshes which don't contain a current source. So um, effectively, we couldn't write a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation around mesh D if we tried, because that current source there, um, we have no way of expressing our voltage drop across it um, in terms of our mesh currents. So the only relationship that we're gonna get out of a mesh that has a current source on the perimeter of the circuit is that current relationship equation. And we'll find out in just a moment when we count things up that we have exactly the correct number of equations needed to solve this system. Um, so, the only mesh that we could write a KVL equation for that does not contain a current source would be mesh B. So let's go ahead and write a KVL at mesh B equation. So who wants to help me out there? Uh, negative four volts. Okay, so negative four volts. plus three ohms times IB minus IA. All right. And then plus two IX. And then set it equal to zero. Thank you again, Baylor. So if we look here, we have one equation, two equations, three equations, four equations, and five equations. And we had five unknown quantities, our mesh currents, IA, IB, IC, ID, 
and our controlling variable ix, five equations, five unknowns, this is a system that can be solved. Once again, either just throwing all of this directly into MathCAD or making some substitutions like anywhere we see ID, we could replace it with six amps. Uh, anywhere we see IX, we could replace it with ID minus IC. And we'd be able to simplify this down to a three equation, three unknown system that we could solve. Um, so this is how we handle mesh analysis when our circuits have current sources. Does anybody have any questions? For the uh, third step on IX, does it, uh, how do we decide which one's minus and positive on that ID minus IC? Sure. So when we follow ID around its path, it's flowing up, which is in the same direction as IX. So that's why it gets a plus sign. When we follow IC around its path, it's flowing down when it goes through the 5 ohm resistor, which is in the opposite direction of IX, and that's why it gets minus sign. Thank you. Yep, and that's the rule that we apply for all currents that we want to express in terms of mesh currents. Just like in nodal analysis, whenever we wanted to express any voltage in terms of nodal voltages, it was the voltage, uh, the nodal voltage at the positive polarity terminal minus the nodal voltage at the negative polarity terminal. In mesh analysis, it's the mesh current that's in the same direction minus the mesh current that's in the opposite direction. So very, very similar concepts. All right, so um, once again, if we felt like it, we could set up this system of equations and solve it and all that kind of good stuff, but that's not really helping us learn anything about mesh analysis itself. Uh, so I am of the opinion that we should look at the in-class assignments. Anybody um, opposed to just jumping ahead to the ICA? I do have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, so the super meshes only go around the interior current sources? Exactly correct. And okay. not only do they only go around the interior current source, it needs to be the smallest possible path that combines those two meshes. So realistically, we could have done something like this. a path like this to avoid um, taking the voltage drop across the 5 amp source. However, that's leaving out important information. So if we want to make sure that our answer is correct, we need to make it the smallest possible combination of, meth, uh, of meshes. I have a question also, Dr. Hart. Sure. So let's just say in theory, if you took that five amp current source and put it to the left side of that intersection, electrically, it would still be equivalent, right? And so you say the five amp the mesh band? So if I put my, if I swapped the five amp source and the three ohm resistor? No, sir, you literally just move the five amp source to the left of that intersection point. So just to be clear here, if I put the five amp source here. Yes, sir. So that would move my super mesh over. So instead of it dipping down here into mesh C, it would instead dip down into mesh um, B. Sorry, I'm erasing. Too much stuff. Those wouldn't be electrically equivalent, though? They would not. Correct, because of how the current's flowing. Yep. So that's uh, so our new super mesh would be between A and B because the current source is shared between meshes A and B. And 
we would have wound up writing just a simple KVL equation around mesh C after we came up with our KCL equation for our, excuse me, KVL equation for our super mesh. Any other questions before we look at our in-class assignment? So let me go back uh, a couple of steps and I'm just going to mention something that I'm a little bit surprised that you guys didn't, but it's okay. Um, actually, let me see if I can do this faster by getting my keyboard out, sorry. Okay. I'm uh, sorry, I didn't go quite far enough. So one question that I get asked very often uh, with this particular example problem, which is why I drew it this way, is why the two ohm resistor, so this guy right here, doesn't wind up showing up in any of our equations. Um, and the short answer for that is because the two ohm resistor is in series with a current source, the voltage drop across the two ohm resistor is effectively a known quantity. So it doesn't need to show up in our system of unknown things, right? We know definitely that the voltage drop across the two ohm resistor is 10 volts. Um, we're avoiding that path so that 10 volts is going to be effectively in series with whatever voltage drop across, uh, uh, is occurring across the five amp resistor, or excuse me, five amp current source, which we don't know, but that path around it will take that into account. So it's perfectly acceptable to avoid the two ohm resistor if it's in series with the current source like I have it drawn here. So I just wanted to make that very clear. All right, so let's look at the ICA. So in this first problem, we are simply asked to use mesh analysis to determine the values of some mesh currents. Our circuit contains only voltage sources. So this is pretty straightforward application of mesh analysis, nothing particularly fancy here. Um, it looks like our meshes have already been identified for us and our mesh currents have already been assigned. So we could go ahead and skip to step three, which would be to define our controlling variable in terms of our mesh currents. So who would care to take a crack at that? Ix equals I1 minus I2. Exactly right. Um, and now we could move along to our next step, which is just to write our KVL equations around our meshes. So let's start at mesh one. What's our KVL equation going to look like? Uh, negative eight negative. volts. So negative eight volts plus... 14 ohms times I1. 14 ohms times I1, thank you, plus... 12 ohms times I1 minus I2. And we are back to the node that we started from. So set it equal to zero. Great job. Um, somebody else tell me what's going on with the next mesh. One point five IX plus 22 ohms times uh, I2 minus I3. All right. Plus 12 ohms I2 minus I1 equals uh, zero. Right. Thank you, ma'am. Um, last mesh, somebody tell me that one, please. 22 ohms. Times I three minus I two. Okay. 
five ohms times I three. All right. That's 10 volts equals zero. Right. Equals zero, great. Four equations, four unknowns, solve our system, move along about our day. Uh, for this one, quite obviously the answer is there for those of you guys that want to um, solve it and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm comfortable moving along to problem two if you guys are. All right, nobody told me to stop, so I'm gonna go for it. All right, so in this particular problem, we are asked to use mesh analysis to determine the power supplied by each of our sources in the circuit below. So we're gonna set up our mesh and all of that kind of stuff. And then once we get all of those equations developed, then I'll talk about how we're, how we're gonna use mesh analysis to determine those powers. Um, so for this particular problem, we weren't given any uh, meshes or any mesh currents. So we're gonna have to sort those out ourselves. Um, so I'm gonna call this mesh IA. This one up here, will be IB, and this one down here will be IC. So we've done step one and step two and kind of lumped it together. Um, we don't have any controlling variables, so we get to skip step three. Um, so now, because we have a current source, we're doing that step four, which is to write a current relationship equation. So our current relationship equation should look like three amps is equal to what? IC minus IB. Exactly right. So because that three amp source is on the interior of the circuit, we are going to have to write a K, excuse me, KVL equation around super mesh BC. So I'm going to go ahead and just identify what that path is here in pink. Uh, so I'm going to choose to start here. And then I'm just going to make this kind of diamond shape, like so. So following that particular path, uh, could somebody tell me what our KVL equation is going to look like? 40 times IB minus IA plus 30 IB plus 40 IC plus 30 IC minus IA. Thank you. And then we have one more equation, which is just KC, excuse me, KVL around mesh A. Somebody else tell me what that's going to look like. Negative five volts. All right. Uh, plus the uh, 10 ohms times I. Okay. Plus the 40 ohms times IA minus IB. Plus the uh, 30 ohms times IA minus IC. Plus the IA times the 10 ohms. Or vice versa. Either way. Yeah, either way is fine. All right. So let's actually go ahead and solve this system for mesh currents IA, IB, and IC, because these three quantities are going to wind up being used in calculating our powers, okay? So I'm doing this in my trusty TI-36 um, because I have one, or at least one on every desk I own, I think, at this point. Um, so, my first equation, uh, my coefficient for IA is zero. My coefficient for IB is negative one. My coefficient for IC is positive one. And my constant term is three. 
in my second equation, my coefficient for I A is negative 40 minus 30. My coefficient for I B is positive 40 plus 30. Uh, that's it, so 40 plus 30. Uh, my coefficient for IC is 40 plus 30. And my constant term is zero. So let me just double check that one real quick. So negative 40 from the first term, negative 30 from the last term for the IA, um, positive 40 plus 30 from the first two terms, positive 40 plus 30 from the last two terms. Okay, all that seems legit. Um, for our third equation, my coefficient for IA is gonna look like uh, 10 plus 40 plus 30 plus 10. My coefficient for IB is going to be negative 40. My coefficient for IC should be negative 30 and my constant term should be positive five. So when I solve this system, I get IA to be negative two over 11 amps, um, IB to be negative 35 over 22 amps, and IC I got to be positive 31 over 22 amps. Um, for anyone else that solved the system, did you get similar numbers? Yes. Good deal. All right. So I'm going to assume that uh, we are correct. So now let's go ahead and talk about calculating our powers. So let me scroll up here. So we're specifically asked to determine the power supplied by each source in the circuit shown below. So the power supplied by our five volt source will be the voltage drop across the five volt source, which I believe pretty strongly is simply five volts. And then we need to know what current is flowing into the negative polarity terminal. So which mesh current or combination of mesh currents is flowing into the negative polarity terminal of the five volt source? IA. IA, absolutely right. So I'm just going to go ahead and directly substitute in that negative 2 over 11 amps. And so 5 times that gives me negative 10 over 11 watts, which is the same thing as negative 0 0.909 repeating watts, which matches our answer here. So it seems like we did all of our mesh analysis correctly. Um, for the power supplied by our three amp source, uh, let me do this in, let's say purple here. I'll do slight purple. So we're gonna do something similar. Uh, the current is a known quantity, it's just three amps. So we need to figure out the voltage drop across the three amp source. And specifically, I want the current that's flowing into the negative polarity terminal. So I'm gonna call this guy right here, V3A. That's very hard to read, so I'll move it down here. So this part is significantly trickier, but because we've we already know what all of those mesh currents are. We're now free to write a KVL equation just around mesh B or around mesh C to figure out what that voltage is. So let me put this over here. So if we did KVL around mesh C, um, we would have negative V3A the thing that we're looking for, plus 
40 ohms times IC, where IC is now a known quantity, and plus 30 ohms times IC minus IA, uh, and that's equal to zero. So if we rearrange this really quickly, we would see that that voltage V3 amps is just 70 ohms times IC minus 30 ohms times IA. And if I put that in my calculator, so 70 times Z minus 30 times X, that looks like 1,145 over 11 volts or 104.090 volts. Um, so we would have positive 104.090 volts times 3 amps. And that comes out to be 312.273 watts, which is exactly what we should expect. So once we know all of our mesh currents, then we can use KVL really anywhere we want to find any other voltage that we weren't able to find earlier. So pretty powerful thing. Um, any questions regarding this problem before we move along to number three? So does it not matter that we had a current flowing into the negative terminal because we are looking for the supply power? So I defined my voltage so that the current would be flowing into the negative polarity terminal, because whenever my current is flowing into the negative polarity terminal, um, I times V is my supplied power. Whenever the current is flowing into the positive polarity terminal, I times V is the absorbed power. Okay, gosh, thank you. No problem. Any other questions? All right, so let's look at problem number three. So this one is going to mess with us a little bit, um, which is why I drew it the way that I drew it. Uh, it's actually going to mess with us in two ways, so we're going to talk about things here. Um, but we are once again asked to use mesh analysis, and we want to determine the voltage Vx as well as the power supplied by each of the sources in our circuit. Um, this circuit contains only current sources. Um, so, uh, and also we can see that there is a current source on the interior. So we're gonna have a little bit of work to do. All right, so let's start by defining our meshes. Um, so let's do this top left mesh as mesh A with an associated mesh current IA. Um, this guy will be mesh B with a mesh current IB. And lastly, down here, we'll have mesh C with a mesh current IC. So our first equation that we're going to have to come up with is expressing our voltage Vx in terms of our mesh currents. And I drew this voltage Vx diagonally across like so um, to make you guys think about things here. So before I talk you through it, does anybody have any thoughts or suggestions as to what we might do? Just continue like normal, pretty much. So what would continuing like normal look like? Whichever uh, current's flowing into the positive is positive. Whichever one's flowing in the opposite direction gets the negative. So 
generally speaking, I agree with that. Um, but here, I would argue we might face a little bit of trouble doing that. So let me explain what I mean by that specifically, right? Um, the way that I have drawn the voltage VX with positive polarity on the bottom right of mesh A and the negative polarity terminal on the top left of mesh A um, makes it seem like the voltage VX is a voltage drop across an open circuit. So to me, that tells me that I'm either going to have to write a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation around this triangular path in order to get Vx, or I'm going to have to write one around this triangular path. Technically, either of these will work and will wind up giving us the correct answer in the end. I'm going to wind up effectively writing my KVL equation around this one. But if I look at this, I don't even really need to write the KCL equation at all. So this is where I like to do things that kind of mess with you guys' head a little bit to see who's paying attention. So let me erase these paths and explain this in a slightly different way. So the negative polarity terminal of this voltage Vx is associated with this node over here on the right, which I've just labeled in dark green, okay? So anywhere along that node is the negative polarity terminal. So I could just as easily define my negative polarity terminal to be here, which means that our voltage Vx is nothing more than the drop over the 21 ohm resistor. And then we can do exactly what you mentioned and just say that Vx is going to be equal to the current that's flowing into, excuse me, 21 ohms times the current flowing into the positive polarity terminal, which is Ia, minus the current flowing into the negative polarity terminal, which is Ic. So I talked a lot there. Um, does everybody understand where this relationship came from? Yes, sir. Okay. So just to be super clear, I love to be a jackass and give you guys those diagonal voltages like that on your exams. So I just, I'm being very forthright about it. I like doing stuff like that to make you pay attention and try to figure things out. So if you didn't understand that, I'm happy to explain it again. Um, if you did understand it, that's great. Make sure you continue to understand it because I'm positive something like that's going to pop up in your test next week. Okay. So we've got our controlling variable equation written. So now we need to write some current relationship equations. Okay. So let's start with the dependent current source there on the interior of the circuit. So we're going to have 0 0.5 Vx is equal to what? Ic minus Ib. Ic minus Ib. Absolutely correct. Thank you for that. And we're going to have a current relationship equation for our 7 amp source as well. What's that going to be? Just a uh, positive IC. Positive IC. Thank you, Baylor. And so this is where we would normally try to come up with a super mesh. Okay. And so what I'm referencing here is the fact that we have a current source that's on the interior of our circuit, this guy right here. But 
has it. So um, this current source is being shared between mesh B and mesh C. So if I tried to set up a Kirchhoff's voltage law loop, combining these two meshes, it might look something like this. Why can't I write a KVL equation around this path? Is it because of the seven amps? That's exactly right. So when our super mesh winds up containing a current on the perimeter of the circuit, we are not able to write a KVL equation. So we do have a super mesh, but we can't write a KVL equation. So the only thing that we have left to do is to just write a KVL equation around mesh A. And if you'll notice, we have one equation from defining Vx, a second equation from our current relationship, a third equation from our current relationship. When we write our KVL equation around mesh A, that's going to give us our fourth equation, and we only have four unknowns. So we don't need another equation anyway, right? So all we need to do here is just write KVL around mesh A. So somebody tell me what that's going to look like, please. Five ohms uh, times IA plus 16 ohms uh, times IA minus IB. All right. Plus 21 ohms IA minus IC equals zero. Absolutely right. So there is our fourth equation. And we could solve this system, right? Um, by substituting um, seven amps everywhere we see IC would give us a three equation, three unknown system. Um, so we can do that. We could throw it in MathCAD. We could buy a calculator that's capable of doing four equations, four unknowns, whatever. Um, so from there, solving for VX is fairly straightforward. So now let's talk about solving for our powers. So this is gonna be pretty similar uh, to what we did in the last problem, right? So if we were looking for the power absorbed by our seven amp source, or excuse me, uh, power supplied by our seven amp source, we would need to define a voltage drop across our seven amp source. Let's do it this way, where the current is flowing into the negative polarity terminal. So this would be V seven amps. Okay. So how would we go about solving for that voltage V seven amps? And let's assume that we solved our mesh system of equations already so that all three of our mesh currents were known. How would we go about solving for this voltage? We have to write a KVL for the seven amp. Exactly right. So technically speaking, any KVL loop should work. Um, we just want to make sure that we're making a KVL loop where every quantity other than the voltage drop across the seven amp source is a known quantity. So for me, I would choose to write a KVL equation around the outside perimeter like so. So that KVL equation, um, so let's just put this KVL around outside loop. Um, I would have five ohms times IA plus 20 ohms times IB is equal to V7S. 
or minus V7A is equal zero. And then I just move that V7A over. So that's how I would do that one. And then the power absorbed by the seven amp source would just be V7A times the seven amps. Um, we would follow a very similar process for our dependent source, right? So I could define a voltage here. Let's call it V. Sorry, that current would be entering the positive. So let me do it this way. So let's call it V dependent like so. And realistically here, I would just choose any path I want um, as long as it doesn't contain an unknown quantity. So I might go around this path right here. So if we did KVL around mesh B, we would see that 16 ohms times IB minus IA plus 20 ohms IB plus 25 ohms IB minus IC would be equal to negative V dependent. And then the power absorbed, or excuse me, supplied by our dependent source would just be that voltage V dependent times 0 0.5 VX. I'll leave it for you guys to plug things in and sort that out, but that's the process. All right. Um, anybody have any questions about mesh analysis or literally anything else circuits related? Let's see what's going on in the chat. How do you work a problem using mesh that has two internal current sources? So uh, let me make one up, Lily. So let's say that we have the following problem. Um, So before I go about solving this, Lily, is this a kind of situation like you were referring to? I was talking about one that also has a dependent source in it as well as the two internal current sources. So, does the dependent source need to be a current source or could it be a voltage source? Um, it, it doesn't matter. So let me put that back as five amps and then you just want a dependent source in general, right? Yes, sir. I'm, uh, I'm gonna be sneaky here and you'll see what I mean in a moment. I'm gonna put a dependent current source here. Uh, let's make this a current source in this direction. Let's make it twice Vx. And let's call the voltage drop across this two ohm resistor Vx. Okay. So before we begin, does this satisfy what you were talking about? I have two internal current sources and I have a dependent source. Anything you want me to change before we take a crack at it? That's good. Okay. All right, so let's identify our meshes. So let's call this one mesh A. 
this one matched B. And this one matched C. Um, Lily, would you mind telling me how we are going to express the voltage Vx in terms of our mesh currents? Um, it would be Ia times two ohms. So um, you're very close. It's going to be negative. negative. Two ohms times Ia, because Ia is flowing into the negative polarity terminal of the two ohm resistor. So quite close, but you know, still an important distinction. All right. Um, somebody tell me what my current relationship equation for the three amp source is going to be. IB minus IA. Exactly right. What about for the five amp source? IC minus IB. Um, so I disagree with that one. It, it reverse. I got the polarity mixed up. It would be... IB minus IC. Exactly right. And lastly, for the 2VX current source. Would it, be okay. would it be negative IC? It exactly would be negative IC. How many equations do I have, Lily? Four. How many unknowns do I have, Lily? <laughs> um, you have, you have, in the equations, you have, Four, right. So uh, I, I think I said earlier that I was being a bit of a jackass with this one. Uh, so I drew this circuit in such a way that we actually wouldn't have to use Kirchhoff's voltage law at all to get our system of equations using mesh analysis. Um, so because we have these two internal current sources, our inclination would be to write a super mesh equation around the outside. However, that outside path contains the voltage drop across a current source. So we couldn't have written a KVL equation. Um, so all we needed was those three current relationship equations for our current sources, as well as our definition of VX in terms of our mesh currents. Now, to answer a question that I think is more in line with what Lily was actually asking, Let's change that current source to a voltage source. Okay. So now we would be able to write a KVL equation around the outside. Um, so that would look like 2 ohms times IA plus 8 ohms times IB plus twice Vx plus 10 ohms times Ic is equal to zero. And now we once again have four equations, four unknowns, so we could solve it up. Oops, sorry about that. 
Did that I know you I said that oh sorry, I'm go sorry. ahead again. Uh, I know you said that you like to move around the polarities and put them diagonally. If you took that negative polarity on VX and moved it to the bottom right corner of the square it's already in, mm -hmm. would it still be effectively the same as how it was before? Yes, it would. Okay. That is a great sure. way. Uh, that, that is exactly the kind of stuff that I like to do. I put the either the positive polarity terminal or a negative polarity terminal in an odd place, but it usually just winds up being the voltage drop across a single resistor or something like that. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. All right, I have kind of two questions about problem sure. three, the in-class assignment. So you mm -hmm. said the reason why seven didn't make a, uh, a super mesh is because it was on the outside, the exterior of the circuit? Right, so we could not write a KVL equation around that purple path. So if we tried, uh, I'll, I'll put it down here. So let's start right here. Um, so we would wind up having like 16 ohms times IB minus IA plus 20 ohms times IB plus the voltage drop across the seven amp source, which we literally cannot express in terms of our mesh currents, plus 21 ohms times IC minus IA is equal to zero. So because that path winds up taking the voltage drop across a current source, we wouldn't be able to use that in our initial mesh analysis system of equations because it's introducing another unknown that we have no way of expressing in terms of our mesh currents. Okay. All right. And then, so is there, the... oh, go ahead. Sorry, is there ever a voltage drop across a current source? Like, how are we able to, to use that? Um, defined power, but we can't use it here in the super mesh. So there is absolutely a voltage drop across the current sources. Like if you evaluate what this V7A is going to be, you'll find out that it's non-zero, but it requires us to already know what the mesh currents IA and IB are in order for us to get that voltage. So that's why we have to avoid it when we are doing our initial system of equations. Once we know what all of those mesh currents are, then we can use that information to write KVL in places that we couldn't earlier to get those unknown voltages. Is that so in theory, sense? if we were to find IA and IB first, we could go back and find the voltage drop if we needed to? Exactly right. And that's 100% what I was asking you to do in this problem. Understand. Right, and my other question was just about the uh, positive and negative uh, signs. Would you always yeah. move the negative to the positive one? Um, I'm not entirely sure I understand your question. So... With how you moved it down adjacent to the positive one already, uh, to the 21 ohm resistor. Okay. Would you always do that if they were uh, diagonally adjacent like this? Not necessarily. So I chose to do, I chose to move this one down here because in doing so, I was able to recognize the voltage VX is just the drop over the 21 ohm resistor. If I left it alone, I could still write, so let's say that I left it exactly where it was. I could still write a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation around this path, right? So um, if I start from here, the first thing that I would see is the negative polarity terminal of VX. Then I would see the 21 ohm resistor. And 
mesh current IA is flowing into the positive polarity terminal, mesh current IC is flowing, excuse me, um, yeah, mesh current IC is flowing into the negative polarity terminal is equal to zero. Rearranging, I get VX is 21 ohms IA minus IC, which is the exact same result I got by just moving that negative polarity terminal down and observing that VX is the voltage drop across the 21 ohm resistor. So moving that negative polarity sign down along that node just helped me get the exact same result I would have gotten using Kirchhoff's voltage law a little faster. All right. And for what it's worth, there would be nothing at all wrong with doing KVL around this path, right? So if we did it this way, we would have VX is equal to, or excuse me, a VX plus five ohms times IA plus 16 ohms times IA minus IB is equal to zero. So VX would be negative five ohms times IA minus 16 ohms IA minus IB. This looks incredibly different than this guy right here, but it's actually gonna wind up giving you the exact same answer. So worst case scenario, if you can't figure out where to move the, like where along the node to move the, um, the sign to make it easier, don't move it and just use KVL. You'll still right. come the right, you'll still come out with the exact same answer. It's just gonna take you a little bit longer. If right, we were doing, good. yeah, if we were doing a nodal analysis problem, um, the location of the polarity terminals don't really matter. So if this were node A and this were node B, then VX would just be VA minus VB. Who cares where the negative polarity terminal is? As long as it's along that same node. For better or for worse, there's always at least two to three ways to do th uh, things in the circuits and still come up with the same answer. The, the hard part is figuring out which way gives you the answer correctly uh, in the most efficient use of your time. Any other questions? So, when do we know when to use nodal analysis or this method? Uh, great question. So let me let me expand your question uh, expand your question slightly. Okay. So at this point, um, we are effectively one lecture away from when we have our exam review and all of that kind of good stuff. So we're almost or a little under a week out from the earliest point that you can take your test, which reminds me, I really need to get the practice exams up. So I'm gonna do that um, here in just a couple of moments. Um, but anyway, so we have several different circuit analysis techniques in our pocket now, right? We know Ohm's law, we know Kirchhoff's voltage law, we know Kirchhoff's current law, um, we know voltage division, we know current division, we know um, the superposition theorem. Now we know nodal analysis and we also know mesh analysis. So we have a lot of different things that we could possibly use to analyze the circuit. So I'm just gonna talk to you about my thought process, okay? So typically speaking, uh, when I am analyzing a circuit, I am going to simplify it as much as I possibly can, 
So that means if I have any resistors in parallel, I'm going to combine them into a single parallel resistance. If I have resistors in series, I'm going to combine them into a single series resistance. If I have voltage sources in series, I'm going to combine them. If I have current sources in parallel, I'm going to combine them. I want to start with the smallest possible circuit that I can have without losing any information. Okay. Then once I've simplified the circuit, I look for, can I solve for whatever I'm looking for just using Ohm's law, KVL, or KCL? I always try to start with the simplest things first. If those don't seem like they're going to work quickly, then I see if it's something I can apply voltage or current division for. If those don't seem like they're gonna work out, that's when I bring in nodal and mesh. So to make the decision between using nodal versus mesh, um, there's a couple of different things that I'm looking at, okay? So the first thing that I'm probably looking at is which one gives me the smaller system of equations to solve, right? So I, I have a circuit that only has two meshes, but it has seven nodes. Mesh analysis is gonna be a lot easier to set up. Um, and I'm going to have less opportunities to make mistakes. Similarly, if I have a current that has um, only a couple of nodes, but uh, several meshes, because let's say everything was in parallel, uh, then chances are I'm going to do nodal analysis just because it gives me a smaller system of equations to deal with. Okay. If the number of equations that I'm going to have to set up is roughly the same, then um, if I'm solving for a voltage, I would use nodal analysis. And if I'm solving for a current, I would use mesh analysis. So that's my decision-making tree for which analysis technique I'm going to use on any given circuit. Awesome, thank you. You're very welcome. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, in regards to the practice exam, how good of a gauge is that compared to the actual exam for what we can expect for our own results? So with regards to level of difficulty, it's effectively the same. So uh, actually, while I have you guys here, I'm going to go ahead and put those practice exams up on Canvas so that I don't forget about it. Uh, so let me do that really quickly. I'm just going to do it on my desktop computer. And I apologize for having not done it earlier. Uh, what the hell happened there? Let's see. Engineering 221. Uh, I wish it would let me put a folder there, but it won't. Okay. Old tests, exam one. All right, so I just put, I believe it's three old exam ones as well as some solutions. Um, on Canvas under class meeting number 10, exam one review session. So all of that stuff is there. Um, you got, it's all been published, so you guys should have access to it. Um, feel free to ask me any questions that you want about them. I, I, I want to be very clear here. Um, these tests are from previous years, some as far back as 2019. Um, Okay, so a couple of things actually. Um, so first thing, some of these tests, because they are from so, uh, they're so old, they are from when I was giving three hour exams on purpose. Uh, meaning that they have like 35 questions. Your exam will not have 35 questions. It will have five um, theory questions at the beginning, whereas some of these exams may have 10. And then it'll have 20 circuit analysis related questions, whereas these exams had 25. 
Um, so the exam that you will be taking next week is designed to only take you hopefully less than two hours, um, but you will have a full three hours to take it just because you have to write out the circuits and all of that kind of stuff yourself. So you will have three hours to do it, but it is not going to be as long as these exams that were designed to be taken in three hours. So that's my first caveat. Uh, the second thing that I wanna say is that um, when I was making these tests, I was usually doing all of it by myself. Um, and I, I say that to say there are definitely some mistakes throughout these exams. Uh, it might be that, you know, uh, the correct answer isn't actually available or something like that. Um, usually happened because I was working until two o'clock in the morning just trying to get stuff finished and I got sleepy and I wasn't paying attention. So if there's a problem and you are sure you're doing it right and the correct answer isn't on there, don't freak out about that. Just shoot me an email and say, hey, Dr. Hartman, would you mind reworking this problem? I think you might not have the right answer on there and I'll be happy to do it. I just haven't had time to go through and update these old tests to make sure that everything's in tip top shape. So um, all of that to say, take the correct answers with a grain of salt. I am tired and I make mistakes. All right. So Austin, I think I interrupted you to rant. Um, what were you gonna go on about? Oh, sorry. That was it. I was just asking, like, what's the how how good of a gauge what are the okay. practice exam versus the actual exam? Yeah. So um, I made all of those practice exams um, completely by myself. I am making your upcoming exam completely by myself. So um, the circuits that I am asking you to analyze will definitely be different. Um, but the level of difficulty, the the content, the structure, all of that kind of stuff should be roughly the same. So I believe very firmly that the practice exams as well as the in-class assignments are a very good way to practice for my tests because they let you know the types of questions I like to write. That makes sense, thank you, sir. No problem. Any other questions? Would you mind doing something from an in-class assignment? Not at all. Um, in class assignment number five, part A, I was getting the wrong answer for that. Let me look that one up really quickly because I don't think I have it downloaded to my new laptop. Uh, ICA number five, you said part A specifically. Okay. So this is a superposition problem. Let me find where the heck my pen went to. Sorry, my new pen, uh, surface pen is black and my top of my desk is black. So it took me a moment to find it. All right, so I see a number five. So this is the circuit that we are given. So we have a 17 ohm resistor connected in parallel to a one amp source. We have a 20 ohm resistor, 10 ohm resistor, a seven ohm resistor and a five volt source like so. The quantity VX that we are interested in is the voltage drop across the 20 ohm resistor, um, positive polarity on the left and for part A in particular, we are asked to determine the contribution of the one amp current source to the voltage Vx. So that means we're gonna leave the one amp current source on and we're gonna turn the five volt source off. So how do we turn a five volt source off? You're just gonna turn it into a wire, right? Exactly right. So I'm gonna take my five volt source out 
and I'm going to replace it with a short circuit. So I now have a 10 ohm resistor in parallel with a 7 ohm resistor in parallel with a short circuit. So what's going to happen to the 10 ohm resistor and the 7 ohm resistor? You can just combine them because they're in parallel. But they're in parallel with a short circuit. So what happens when a resistor is in parallel with a short circuit? Oh, does it get ignored? Because it'll just go through the short circuit? Exactly right. So this 10 ohm resistor and this seven ohm resistor wind up getting bypassed. So really all that we have is a 17 ohm resistor in parallel with a one amp source in parallel with a 20 ohm resistor and our voltage Vx prime is just the voltage drop across all of those things in parallel. So we would have Vx prime is equal to one amp times 20 ohms times 17 ohms over 37 ohms. Yeah, that, that was my mistake. Thank you, Dr. Hartman. No problem. Any other questions? All righty. Well, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Um, obviously, you should be studying for my upcoming test, but I genuinely don't want you guys to freak out about anything. Um, if you have any questions, I will be working on the test over the weekend, uh, which means I should be actually at my computer and relatively paying attention to email to avoid working on your test. Um, so feel free to ask any questions that you may have, and I'll answer them as soon as I'm able. Uh, I am going to try to get a respondus practice test type thing up uh, at some point this weekend so that you guys can kind of play around with that as well, uh, just so that you're comfortable with um, the system. Um, that's enough out of me for today, unless anybody has anything else. You said you're going to have evening blocks for the exam? Uh, yes. So there will be a, uh, it's my hope, I'm going to do it, whether, or I, even if I have to stay up all damn night to get it sorted out. Uh, but I'm going to have five different versions of the test. One will be on Wednesday night after the review session. Uh, then there will be one Thursday afternoon, then Thursday night, Friday afternoon, and Friday night. And you can just take whichever version of the test you care to take. You don't need to let me know which one it is. Um, just So just take whichever one aligns best with your schedule and your level of preparedness. Um, I want to be very clear about this. You can only take one version of the test. So if you take more than one, you are cheating and you will fail. I've had somebody try to be a jerk like that before. So that's why I want to be very clear about it. Anything else? All right. Well, I will see you guys on Monday. Thank you.